This video is made possible by The Great Courses Plus, an on-demand video learning service. Learn at your own pace with no tests, no schedules. Check out a free trial of The Great Courses Plus through the link in the description below. More about them in a bit. Hello everybody, welcome to Mega Projects. Various requests have been made to talk about giant rockets, particularly the Apollo program, particularly Saturn V. In fact, people were saying, Simon, why don't you talk about the Apollo program? I'm like, well, because it's substantially massive and took place over many, many years and got people to the moon. So I thought what we could do is break it down into different parts. Not that I've done different parts. I've only got the first part, which is all about the Saturn V rocket, which is obviously the video you are watching right now. If there are other parts of the Apollo program that you would like me to cover, what you need to do is let me know in the comments below. And while you're down there, smash that like button, because why not? Or if you don't like these videos, smash the dislike button, but you clicked on it, so here you are. Enjoy, maybe? For all of the extraordinary achievements that humanity has seen, few have been quite as spectacular as our voyages into space. Witnessing a space launch is unlike anything else on Earth. The thunderous roar that begins as flight control counts down through ten, a fireball billowing out from beneath the rocket. Steadily, the rocket begins to climb, gathering speed until it is but a dot on the blue Floridian sky. But none of it would be possible without what lies below the astronauts. And there was never a rocket quite like the Saturn V. I thought about trolling everyone by calling it the Saturn V throughout the video, but then I thought <laughs> that would get annoying really fast. The Saturn V rocket was a beast. There's not really any other way to describe it. It remains the tallest, heaviest, and most powerful rocket ever used. While Neil Armstrong and his one small step made headlines around the world, it was the staggering 34.5 million newtons, that 7.6 million pounds of thrust below him, that got him into space. And the other two guys that everyone forgets. Buzz Aldrin and... Uh... <laughs> Even the third guy whose name I can't remember. The one who didn't walk on the moon. Or maybe he did later. Collins! Michael Collins! To give you an idea of what kind of power that is, it's more than the output of 85 Hoover dams over the same short period. The Saturn V measured 111 meters in length, which is roughly the height of a 36-story building, or 18 meters taller than the Statue of Liberty, or if you're British, that's about 15 meters taller than Big Ben. A fully fueled Saturn V rocket waiting to launch weighed around 2,800 tons. Much of that weight was the fuel propellant needed to push the rocket up into space. Now, on a typical mission, the Saturn V burnt through a staggering amount of fuel, about 20 tons of fuel every single second. Its total consumption would be enough to send a typical car that gets 30 miles to the gallon around the world 800 times. Now you might be thinking that they need to make everything as light as humanly possible. And yes, that is the case, but this rocket was still able to launch 130 tons into orbit. It was constructed mainly of aluminium with smaller amounts of titanium and polyurethane also. Interestingly, cork was used as a layer above some of the panels to absorb moisture and keep them cool. As much as everybody involved with such an extraordinary project deserves credit, there is one person in particular who has become synonymous with the Saturn V, and his name was Werner von Braun. He's a man who worked on the fearsome V-2 rockets that Nazi Germany used against Britain towards the end of World War II. In 1946, he and around 700 scientists who had worked for the Nazis were quietly brought over to the United States during something called Operation Paperclip. This was a program that was authorized by President Truman to recruit as many of the top scientists still in Germany at the end of the war in order to gain a competitive advantage over their Soviet rivals. It's always interesting how, you know, things can be forgotten to suit the needs at the current time. Yeah, this guy who was making rockets that bombed London, it's like, hey, come build our moon rockets, please. Anyway, between 1946 and 1957, von Braun was used almost exclusively to gain a better understanding of the V-2 rockets, despite his obvious talent regarding the future of space rocketry. Things changed dramatically on the 4th of October 1957, as radios around the world began picking up the signal being sent by the Soviet Sputnik 1, the first satellite in space. Suddenly, there was a really real threat, and the Americans realized they were a bit behind in the old space race. So they turned to von Braun, and, well, 
he would become enormously influential, as you know, in the development of the Saturn V. Between 1960 and 1962, the Marshall Space Flight Center, MSFC, designed four different versions of the Saturn rockets, each with different missions involving an Earth orbit or lunar missions in mind. These were C-1, C-2, C-3, and C-4. Creative naming! The C-1 was eventually developed into Saturn I, Saturn V's older, less capable brother, while C-2 was scrapped early on with preference to the C-3, which was designed with the Earth orbit rendezvous concept in mind. This was an idea that NASA Mulder over that would have called for various sections of the rocket to be assembled separately in space. This was an idea that was ultimately rejected in favor of the Lunar Orbit Rendezvous LOR, which was used on all the Apollo missions to the moon. Just a quick side note here, the LOR was in fact a technique of landing on the moon first proposed by a Ukrainian Soviet engineer, Yuri Kondratyuk, as early as 1919. But it was NASA who greatly developed the theory. The LOR called for the main spacecraft and a lunar module to travel to the moon together. After arriving, the spacecraft would remain in lunar orbit while the lunar module descended to the surface. Once work was completed on the moon, the module would take off and rendezvous with the main spacecraft once again. The crew and whatever they had brought up from the moon would then transfer back over to the spacecraft and the lunar module would then be cut adrift before the astronauts made their way home. C4 was essentially a larger version of the C3, but would have needed only two launches for an Earth orbit rendezvous rather than three. The C5 concept was announced in 1962. It would be a rocket component of three sections or stages. The S1C is the first stage with five F1 engines, the S2 second stage had five J2 engines, and the S4B third stage had a single J2 engine. The first and second stages would detach once they had been used, while stage three would remain with the spacecraft. In 1963, NASA opted for the C5 model, and it was renamed the Saturn V. The rocket would be built by outside contractors who would each assemble different sections. I, uh, I, if you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm at Simon Whistler, and I recently posted a picture of a news article that I saw on the BBC's website, and it was like, why are astronauts afraid on the launch pad? And I mean, I posted it with the obvious because they're sitting on top of a giant rocket and someone commented <laughs> because they're sitting on top of a giant rocket made by the lowest priced contractor. And I thought this was particularly amusing. Anyway, anecdote over, let's move on. Now, just before we continue with today's video, let me take a moment to tell you about today's sponsor, The Great Courses Plus. You can learn from the world's best professors on The Great Courses Plus. You want a recommendation for a course? Well, I'm gonna give one to you. Look, you're watching a video all about the Saturn V, and look, they've got a course called Apollo 11, Lessons for All Time. Now, this is a shorter one for The Great Courses Plus. It's made up of just four lectures, but they have range. For example, one of them talks about what we can learn from moon rocks, and another one talks about the geopolitics of space and kind of how it all developed since Apollo 11 and landing on the moon. So, yeah, like I say, range. Basically, The Great Courses Plus, uh, and that is just one course about one subject. Uh, it's really what they have on there is incredible. Like, if you've seen something on this channel and you go look it up on Great Courses Plus, you're probably going to find a significant amount of education related to that subject. Anyway, The Great Courses Plus is like a university education, but at your own pace. No tests, no schedules, incredibly easy to access. You can do it on your PC, phone, tablet, however you wish. They've also got audio streaming, which I love because I'm a busy dude. I don't always have time to sit there lazily and watch content. Who does that? But you can listen. Seriously, it's pretty great. I just plug in when I'm commuting to work or doing things around the house. It's awesome. So yeah, it's great stuff. Try it for free. There is a link in the description below. And let's get back to today's video. Built by Boeing in New Orleans, most of the Stage 1 rocket was dedicated to fuel. It was 42 meters tall and was 10 meters in diameter. It provided over 7.6 million pounds force, that's 34,000 kilonewtons of thrust, as it surged skyward. And just for fun, that's the equivalent of 120 747 passenger airliners at cruising speed. So 
It's a lot of thrust. Its dry or empty weight was 131 tons, but when fully loaded, it weighed 2,300 tons. Just in case you're interested and lazy with maths, that's 2,169 tons of fuel. It was powered by five Rocketdyne F1 engines arranged in a quincunce, which is the shape of the five dots on a dice, the more you know. The center engine was held in a fixed position, but the four around it could be hydraulically moved to steer the rocket. After takeoff, the center engine was turned off after 26 seconds seconds to limit acceleration, but stage one as a whole fired its engines for 168 seconds. Once it cut off, the rocket was at an altitude of 37 miles, 67 kilometers, which is 195,360 feet, which is roughly five and a half times the cruising altitude of a 747 airliner, and it was traveling at 5,144 miles per hour, which, for reference, is really quick. Stage 2, built at Seal Beach in California by North American Aviation, was composed of five Rocketdyne J2 engines, also in a quincunx shape. At 24.87 meters in length, it was almost half the size of Stage 1, but with the same diameter, 10 meters. It had a dry weight of about 36 tons, and fully fueled, it weighed 480 tons. The second stage blasted the Saturn V through the upper atmosphere with 1.1 million pounds force, 4,900 kilonewtons of thrust. That's just 80. 747s now, just. <laughs> Built by Douglas Aircraft Company at Huntington Beach in California, Stage 3 was the smallest section of the Saturn V. Powered by a single J2 engine, it measured 17.86 meters in length with a diameter of 6.6 .6 meters. It came with a dry weight of 10 tons and fully fueled weighed 119 tons. This differed from the other stages in that the engine could actually be restarted, and if you had any hope of getting to the moon, this was pretty important. Now, the first burn of two and a half minutes occurred just after the cutoff of Stage 2 and it took the spacecraft into a parking orbit. This was just a temporary holding orbit before Stage 3 fired its rocket for the second time, and that would break the parking orbit and push the spacecraft towards the moon. This second burn was known as the translunar injection, and it lasted for six minutes. When this burn occurred on Apollo 8, it was the first time that humans had left low Earth orbit, and it set a new speed record for a crewed spaceflight of 24 thousand miles per hour, which for reference is even faster. From Apollo 9 onwards, Stage 3 was fired for a third time. Around 40 minutes after the translunar injection had begun, a bit of acrobatics was needed. At this point, Stage 3 was still attached to the Command Service Module, the CSM for short, and the Lunar Module, or LEM. But this wouldn't be the case for long. This complex process is known as transposition, docking, and extraction, and involved the CSM detaching from both Stage 3 and the LEM, turning 180 degrees before reconnecting with the LEM. During launch, the CSM is directly above the LEM with its thrusters facing down into it, so this maneuver is needed to ready the CSM to begin traveling using its own power. Roughly 50 minutes later, Stage 3 disconnects entirely and fires for a third time to move it safely away from the spacecraft. The size of the Saturn V made transportation and assembly quite a challenge. Stage 1 traveled down the Mississippi River by barge before using the intercoastal waterway to reach its final destination. Stage 2 traveled to Florida from California by boat via the Panama Canal, while Stage 3 was the only stage small enough to actually be flown. At the Vertical Assembly Building, VAB, the stages were assembled or stacked on a mobile launcher platform, MLP, which consisted of a launch umbilical tower, LUT, with nine swing arms to keep the Saturn V in place. The VAB is quite a beast in itself, and to this day it remains the single largest story building in the world. I've actually been to the Kennedy Space Center. I have seen this thing. It is, I mean, you know it's unbelievably vast, but then you see it in person, and it's like, oh my gosh, it is huge. This building, it occupies 3.665 cubic meters of space, which is definitely enough space to assemble the largest rocket ever constructed. It also makes it one of the largest buildings on the planet by volume. It's, if you get a chance to go to Kennedy Space Center, definitely worth it. It's insane. <laughs> The entire stack was then moved to the launch pad using the crawler transporter CT, which in itself was an extraordinary piece of equipment, weighing a mammoth 2,721 tons. Running on four double-tracked treads, this giant transporter was required not only to move the Saturn V, but also to keep it level for three miles to the launch site. The size and weight of the Saturn V meant that the smallest shift could be disastrous. <laughs> 
As I said earlier, there are few things quite as visually impressive as witnessing a rocket taking off, but it is a sequence that is both carefully crafted and fraught with danger. 8.9 seconds before launch, the Stage 1 ignition sequence begins. The center engine is the first to fire, followed by the remaining four. As the countdown reaches zero, the hold rocket arms release the rocket and it begins to move upward. The launch speed was controlled by the control release mechanism, which involved brackets set into the hold down arm, each with a tapered metal pin, which was then pulled through dies set at the base of stage one at the moment of takeoff. The mechanism provided further stability for the Saturn V for the first 15 centimeters, it's just six inches of the launch. After that, the rocket began to accelerate rapidly. Isn't it? It's just mind blowing that, you know, this thing is so huge, but the precision there is like, yeah, 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 it just needs a little help for the first 15 centimeters. It's difficult to imagine what this moment must feel like, sat staring straight up as the awesome power of the Saturn V begins to push you away from the Earth. If something were going to go wrong at this point, the rocket would not be able to return gently to Earth. Due to the amount of fuel, any failure at this point would likely be catastrophic. The 12 seconds it took the Saturn V to clear the launch tower must have felt like an eternity. The first stage burned for about 2 minutes and 41 seconds, reaching an altitude of 42 miles and a speed of 6,164 miles per hour, which is about 2,756 meters a second, or, you know, so you can understand it better, eight times the speed of sound. The second stage burned for six minutes and hurtled the Saturn V to an altitude of 109 miles and a speed of 15,647 miles per hour. On Apollo 11, the third stage burned for about 2.5 minutes until cutting off 11 minutes and 40 seconds into the flight. The spacecraft was then 1,430 nautical miles downrange, meaning the horizontal distance from where it took off. After the stage three engines cut off, the spacecraft is in that parking orbit. At this point, it's traveling just over 17,400 miles an hour, which is about 28,000 kilometers an hour. After the translunar injections and mid-flight acrobatics that we mentioned earlier, the final section of Saturn V disconnects, leaving the command service module and the lunar module to continue off on their jolly way to the moon. Saturn V's extraordinary job was complete. Well, for Apollo 11, Saturn V at least. The final five Apollo missions involved Stage 3 being crashed on purpose into the surface of the moon with the idea that seismic measurements would be taken to hopefully understand the moon's interior better. The stage three components of Apollo missions 8 through 12 still actually orbiting the Earth to this day. In total, Saturn V rockets were used on 12 Apollo missions, with all but two carrying a human crew. The rockets themselves had a faultless service record, though Apollo 6 and 13 faced technical issues originating in other parts of the spacecraft. Now, we can't talk about the Apollo missions without starting with number 11. The first trip to the moon was one of the most iconic moments of the 20th century, and to this day remains one of the most extraordinary achievements that humanity has ever accomplished. Apollo 12 was famously hit by lightning twice during takeoff, but suffered no significant damage and made a successful landing on the moon. As you probably already know, Apollo 13 came the closest we've ever seen to complete disaster in outer space after the oxygen tank on the service module malfunctioned two days into the mission, causing an explosion. The safe return of the stricken shuttle after catapulting around the moon captivated the entire world, perhaps nearly as much as the first moon landing itself. The final Apollo mission to use the Saturn V rocket was Apollo 17 on the 7th of December 1972. How many knew this would be the last flight was probably quite another matter. There were three further planned Apollo missions, but these were all cancelled, mostly down to budget constraints at a time when the Vietnam War was draining the United States. From 1964 until 1973, $6.4 billion, which is around $37 billion in 2020 money, was spent on research, developments, and flights of the Saturn V. In 1966, NASA received its biggest ever yearly budget, with $4.5 billion going to the space program, about 0.5% of the gross domestic product of the entire United States. Around $1.2 billion, $9.4 billion in today's money, of that was spent on the Saturn V. That year. Between 1969 and 1971, the cost of a single Saturn V Apollo mission was between $185 and $189 million, which is roughly $1.1 billion today. Around $110 million was used for the construction of the Saturn V itself, equivalent to about $700 million in 2020 dollars.
Another reason that the Apollo mission came to a premature end was the deteriorating public interest. Low TV figures for the Apollo 17 mission showed the American public had lost its fascination with the space program. The final outing of the Saturn V was to launch the Skylab, the US's first attempt at a manned space station on the 14th of May 1973. It would be the last time this extraordinary rocket ever defied gravity and blasted into the great unknown. In recent years, there seems to have been a comeback in interest, and the attention the recent SpaceX launch received shows that perhaps the world and the American public is once again looking skyward. Saturn V remains to this day an iconic part of the US space program, a thunderous workhorse of a rocket almost unimaginable in size and power. We may have walked on the moon, but without the Saturn V, we would have never even got off the ground. So I really hope you found that video interesting. I love these rocket ones. I love Apollo. I find the whole space exploration thing super interesting. If you'd like more stuff like this, well, you know, you watched this video to the end, so fantastic. If you've got suggestions, please let me know them in the comments below. I do look at them, especially the most upvoted ones, so vote for what you like. And as always, thank you for watching.